great segue into ours. We've talked a lot this week, we've mentioned a number of times about Saudi Arabia and how they are the only country in the world that has the ability and capacity to turn on and off the spigot and control the oil prices throughout, throughout the world. But what if I told you that by the year 2030, Saudi Arabia may become a net importer rather than a net exporter. They'll lose that capability. They'll have to look for energy elsewhere rather than sending out their own. And of course, who knows what that'll mean to their economy, amongst other things. We had the pleasure of meeting with Austin, who is the president of Dynamic Energy and Water Solutions. He's been working in the oil industry for a number of years and worked working with GE for uh, roughly 20 years. Uh, he was excellent, very interesting, uh, resourceful about the whole area, the whole atmosphere, and one of the most interesting and most basic ideas that this presentation is about and others have touched on is this is not a black or white issue. It's not the ideologues saying, no, just pull, pull oil, pull oil, pull oil, or the ideologues on the other side saying, no, we got to go green, shut down the pipeline, do this, that, and the other. It's about an energy mix and trying to find that nice equilibrium and um, trying to put that over and trying to find a way to even everything out. Find a distribution in your energy production and where you are as a country, what you're producing and what you're bringing in, which will also give you that security. Uh, so quickly, we have Bayer, myself, uh, Nick, um, Christine. Alina, Tong, Thank you. All right, so the first thing is the world production. We, we took his graphs in 2001, and we compared it to our own statistics for 2011. And in 2001 to 2011, energy capacity and production worldwide increased by almost 50%. 50%. 10 years. The interesting thing here is, as you'll see the changes in how, how much energy is being produced, 39 to 42% coal, that's also the added additional 52, 50%. So everything's obviously going up by a chunk, which is why uh, some of the numbers look a little funny going down. 17 to 16 with hydroelectricity, that's not the case. They're just staying consistent. Um, but the nice thing about renewables is that's jumping two to 4% which in a sense means 150% above capacity of what it was doing 10 years ago. So first, here's the OPEC producers. If you look at the colors, this is Algeria and so on, you can see how much of each source each of these countries are using. And what we're focusing on, and what he wanted to focus on, was the interesting difference between Norway and Saudi Arabia why Norway is able to do what they're doing right now, and Saudi Arabia may have a problem if they don't fix it. Uh, so quickly, we'll go back. Saudi Arabia right now is primarily natural gas and oil. There's basically nothing else. And there's not specifically great plans to move forward on that besides the nuclear plant being built. Uh, with with non-OPEC nations, again, we're focusing on Norway. See, Norway, even though it is the leading oil producer in Europe, it's using all hydroelectricity, which is phenomenal. So basically, everything it's pulling from the ground, it's exporting. If Saudi Arabia oil consumption grows in line with peak power demand, the country will be a net importer. So quickly, touching on Norway, the other big, <laughs> the other big uh, argument that's made is that, well, Saudi Arabia uses a lot of power. Look at this comparison. Norway's using over twice what they're using per capita. But because they're able to pull it now, Saudi Arabia doesn't have hydropower, but what do they have a lot of space for solar. But touching on Norway first, their per capita is above any other country we were looking by 2050, remember this is an oil producer, a major oil player, and yet by 2050, they want to go carbon neutral. 
That's amazing. A uh, couple of basic things. They currently have 250,000 people employed in just their oil industry. They have over 50,000 employed just with, just here raising 25.7 billion in revenue. And if you look at here, 15, in 15 years, they're exporting an enormous capacity of energy to their neighboring countries with plans to put in three additional lines to places like Germany and Denmark. Oh, and one of their other big things is they are currently, even though they've got all this going for them, they're currently putting in wind farms as well. So they're really on the front end of trying to have that energy capacity that's going to hold them for the long term. Now we flip to Saudi Arabia. Overall, their demand is 3.4 million barrels of oil today. But according to the sources we were looking at in beta, um, by 2010 and so on, or by 2028, excuse me, they're going to be pulling 8.3 million barrels of oil. And, and, and they're only pulling 11 million barrels a day. So as they continue this trend, they're going to need to, instead of exporting that oil, they're going to bring oil in from other places. Uh, crude oil sold up. Saudi is, is for five to fifteen dollars a barrel. Now that seems cheap, so why not use that? But when you think about basic economics that we've been learning in the MBA class, if they can sell it as a country for, for sixty-five dollars a barrel rather than using it themselves or selling it to their own plants for five to fifteen, look at how much money they're losing every year. So this is the future vision for Saudi. This is the breakup. Instead of just going with hydrocarbons, if they can keep using their hydrocarbons, but as they move forward, try to sell more of those like more of those hydrocarbons, not pull fewer from the ground, not stop tapping or, or stop sitting up pipelines, but just try to sell more rather than using their own as much. And instead, setting up particularly solar, but he was also talking about the possibilities of wind in Egypt and running cables across. Um, thank you. And then, uh, and then also that nuclear power plant that's being set up and looking into more options like that. They have the space and the land capacity. They have the nearby neighborhood and the wind uh, areas. And they, of course, have the technology. So why not find a sustainable way to carry themselves uh, energy-wise in the future? Oh, and this is, a, this is interesting. One of the main ones they're looking at is CSP. Their land, that will work very well, but also that PV that I think UAE was talking about. So you can look at PV cells on all the houses, but they're particularly looking at that CSP for all those open areas and then sending it in on, on uh, transmission lines. Uh, a couple of interesting things he also mentioned, this is offhand, but he was very excited about this and he wanted to enter this in. Some of the stuff that will help with this, UAE, Saudi Arabia, and this region are finding new technologies. Uh, water in Dubai, I think you mentioned, is four times the cost of water in Abu Dhabi. When you run the taps here, it's very expensive. And this shower um, that has just been built is 100%. It's, it's a closed system, so they're reusing 100% of the water. So you basically shower, it goes into something below it, cleans, recirculates, and you have the same water for a period of two years or something crazy. It's amazing. Uh, we were impressed. Uh, of course, your solar panels and then different systems that go along with that. Uh, and then he was also talking about Tesla. And yeah, there is an issue currently with batteries and whatnot, but the idea, Norway's really taken that up. But even if you get these kind of alternative energies or electric vehicles on the road to again cut down on that oil, it doesn't mean, oh, we can get off oil. It means, hey, we can use this great substance for for something like our computers, or building the cars, or whatever else. So the idea is not to go one or the other, but to move forward, and try to follow Norway's example. Any basic questions? 